Uh, assumptions mapping is a team based exercise that I help create. Um, basically, it just helps you really go into desirability, viability, feasibility assumptions and be able to um, essentially like write those down, get them out of your head and then map them so you know where to experiment. And so essentially, uh, this is kind of what it looks like in person anyway. <laughs> so in person, you know, uh, we would use sticky notes. Uh, much of my work is distributed now. So we use things like Mural and, and other platforms. So basically, uh, you do the same thing. But basically, you're writing these down on sticky notes. And then you're uh, talking about them as a team and mapping them out. And then uh, you high five because you're actually working on stuff that matters <laughs> instead of unfortunately, uh, you know, just going off and building whatever you want. And so I feel like, um, again, it's a little bit better than stack ranking because stack ranking is okay, but you're not using, you know, necessarily um, the conversation isn't a structured enough conversation about risk to help you really hone in on the things that you, you need to, uh, to focus on. So I'm going to break today into kind of three parts. And so the three parts are, are we're going to setting the stage and uh, how to set the stage for doing this facilitation and then also next steps and give you kind of a, a little example to play like uh, work with an example today and we'll go from there. So with regards to setting the stage, uh, I feel like there are a couple of things to focus on when, when you first start with uh, really just trying to figure out is what's the right focus for the session. And so first is you really kind of need to ask yourself uh, three different questions. And so, you know, not everyone's working on a new business idea. You know, sometimes it's something a little more uh, refined than, or something, you know, there are different on-ramps into the exercises. And so one of the things I, I ask my teams, you know, before we get started, is like, is this an, a, a product or service or, or, or business idea? And, and I know sometimes it's hard because they're all very related, but uh, sometimes I work with teams that are just working on a new product, you know? Uh, they're not necessarily ready to talk about the business idea uh, as much yet. Uh, service, same thing, you know, we're working on a service and not a product. So does this work there? Um, and then if you're just starting with the business idea, some unmet need, and you're basically building out a, a case from there, I'm just, I like asking some of these questions. So it just gets me help calibrate a bit to see like what exactly uh, are, are is our focus. The other question I often ask is, is this new or existing? And so with uh, new products, you know, it could be something you just literally just came up with, <laughs> you know, uh, existing sometimes it's because you, uh, have something out there and it doesn't have traction. And so you're really trying to figure out, okay, why doesn't it have traction? Why don't we have a uh, fit yet? Why are people churning out? Uh, so maybe we need to do a mapping on that extra on that context there. So we start to understand, you know, is this something we should just retire entirely or, is there some unique kernel of a value proposition here that we can take forward and, and basically run with? And so sometimes, you know, I'm brought in on really, really new stuff. Other times I'm brought in on existing stuff that's kind of floundering in the market and they'd wish they'd use these techniques to launch it. But they didn't. So, you know, they're barely trying to back up and say, you know, did the value prop really resonate? Do we really understand the jobs, pains and gains of the customer? But let's map this out and go from there. So it doesn't have to be like exactly always a brand new business idea. I use assumptions mapping in a little different uh, scenarios, new versus existing, and then product and services as well. And then I also like asking, like, what kind of strong opinions do you have about this idea? <laughs> so people have strong opinions and it's okay. It's okay to have a strong opinion, but uh, it's, it's okay to kind of get that out in the air first, right? So ideally we want opinions that we can go test and uh, they're held loosely, you know, so that we can, find a, a way forward. And, and sometimes if we have a very strong opinion, we're not willing to let go of that can actually inhibit this whole process. So when you think about setting the stage, you know, you, you need to understand the focus of the mapping session, like how you're going to do, like what kind of on ramp you're going to run into the session. And there's a new existing, and then just have the team or yourself, even if this is your idea, talk about what strong opinions do you have? As I mentioned before, um, Obviously, there are some ones that, that are more popular as far as on ramps into the exercise. You know, I, I quite often, you know, do use a canvas, right? Uh, I use canvases quite a bit. Um, and my, my co author, Alex Osterwalder, you know, we often run with a lot of uh, his tools with the business model canvas, value prop canvas. Uh, there are other canvases out there as well. Um, sometimes product roadmaps, 
So I'll be brought into an org and have a product roadmap. It's baked full of assumptions. <laughs> They're trying to figure out uh, how do we go test those? <laughs> so it's not just a bunch of features and dates that you're looking to hit, right? Your roadmap does have, you know, assumptions in it that you can, you know, validate the problem, validate the solution, validate the business model. And so being able to use that, I think also helps. Uh, sometimes I'm brought in uh, really with a backlog. You know, if you look at backlog, you have a backlog of stuff. You know, there's a good chance that down here you have no idea like kind of what's in that backlog as far as certainty goes. Uh, there's a lot of ambiguous stuff in there. And so we kind of use this to kind of drive out some of that ambiguity. You know, as you get to the top, it's more refined. And so being able to use something like uh, an assumptions map, you know, I'll, I'll be brought into a big organization. They're using some flavor of agile. And we take this uh, approach of desirability, viability, feasibility, and we use uh, on their backlog. So we say, hey, what kind of, um, you know, uh, risk are we have around the user or the feature or the benefit? And can we map those out and just make sure we're on the same page with that as well? Uh, other teams, I, other things I love, I, I love uh, Teresa Torres' Opportunity Solution Tree. Uh, she has this two by two in her book as well, um, with credit to me. There's a bunch of great things uh, off that that you can uh, uh, use the two by two as well. Um, another thing I love is from Jeff Patton, you know, user story mapping. Uh, I, I've had the pleasure of uh, using that tool really early on in my career and being able to look at your story map and saying, okay, what big assumptions are we making in the story map? You know, you have your, uh, your map that kind of looks like this, right? And, and basically as you have your map kind of laid out, you are going down and, and you're looking at where, what kind of big assumptions are we making along that map? And so once you have that, you can uh, use that as an on-ramp into it as well. So I just wanted to call this out. I feel like, um, you know, as soon as you put something in a book, everyone's like, well, this is exactly the way I always have to do it. In reality, the book's really based off my coaching and my coaching involves many different uh, companies, <laughs> many different sectors, software, hardware, services. Uh, many different sizes. And so in it, there's not really like a one size fits all for a true by two. Um, when you think of like the ways to get into that process, there are many different ways. So don't feel like, oh, I have to have a canvas or I can't do this, or I have to have a room. Like there, there are many different ways. And really anything you can use as an input to start extracting the, um, the assumptions, right? Desirable, viable, feasible is what's going to be most important here. All right. So today, uh, we're going to use one of my fun examples. So today, we're going to use uh, a company that, um, that uh, it was actually is one of the, the novels I was writing in the past. <laughs> I have many books that are not quite finished, by the way, um, called Truturi. And see, what Truturi is, is it does food printing, right? So basically, think about the food waste that is thrown off, um, you know, by, by a lot of the restaurants, right? It doesn't get recycled. It kind of just ends up in compost. And so what can we do to take things uh, and, and recreate food with them? Now, it's not all kinds of food waste. It's, we're going to narrow in specific ones today. We're talking about um, stale bread, right? Stale pastries, pastry, stuff like that. You can move into a paste and then you can use to basically print pastries that people will then consume and pay a high-end price for, mostly because it's uh, sustainable, but it's also tasty. And it's also really elegantly designed because you're printing it, printing it with a printer, not necessarily creating it by hand. So if we look at a company like this, we could say, okay, um, there are many different uh, business models, different approaches you could take. I'm going to use, uh, it's almost like a, a B uh, to B to C model with this one, but we'll, we'll focus on the, the, the B to B aspect for the most part today, which is uh, we're going to focus on high-end restaurants that care about sustainability, All right? So we want to go after, because it's a kind of an expensive machine, right? And then you have to have the paste and everything and, and some training on it. So we're going to go after high-end restaurants, kind of like luxury restaurants that care about sustainability. And we're going to offer this like value prop to them of, hey, what if we could take this uh, food waste that you have and, and let's design uh, a solution where you can actually sell it back, you know, as something tasty <laughs> instead of throwing it out to your patrons and, and generate revenue that way. So it's kind of like multiple value props, but we want to, I, I like this idea of like transforming, uh, food waste into tasty treats. I think that's a, one way to write it in, in a sentence. So um, you're going to see me talk and write about these themes a lot. <laughs> and you probably have heard me do so over the years. And, uh, you know, this is the team or a sample team we could create around an idea like this. 
And so what you want to do, it's less about the exact role titles, but you want people that can um, articulate the risk around each uh, theme, all right? So I like these themes of desirable, viable, and feasible. I do not create these. Uh, I have a hard time finding the single source of truth of these. Uh, you can go to IDEO and Stanford D School and then back to Larry Keeley and Doblin Group and Chicago Institute of Design and it's decades of human-centered design. Um, I, I just, I think it works. So that's why I keep using it. And so when you think about these kind of um, themes, you can start basically unpacking your risk, the weather, uh, whatever the on-ramp is into the exercise, you're trying to answer these questions of kind of like, do they want this? Does it um, solve for a job that they have? Does it have, uh, you know, uh, address a pain that they might uh, experience? Is it trying to create a gain that they uh, are looking for, right? Uh, with viability, you know, th there's an element of like, should we do this? Now, obviously you have some moral and ethical, you know, <laughs> compasses right, that you're gonna follow in business. But from a financial point of view, it's, can we do this? at a way that it sustains inside the company? Like, can we move the needle in a way that makes sense? And then where we spend almost all our time is, can we do this? Uh, it's technical feasibility. It's also governance, legal compliance. You know, Even something like this, FDA regulated, you gotta make sure that you're doing something that's regulated, uh, that's, that adheres to FDA compliance. And so um, it's not just technical in the sense of, can we build the technology? There is also other things where we're on to feasibility. Can you, you know, you can have something that technically works and it's shut down by uh, policy. So that's something to think about as well. And so we have a team of Kat, who's a designer, uh, Omar, who's a product manager, and Mike, who's an engineer here. Um, you could easily say, you know, uh, you know, we need a researcher as well, right? Uh, you could also say we need somebody from finance in addition to uh, Omar. You could easily say we need somebody from legal in addition to Mike, like basically I'm, I'm less concerned about the exact roles and more concerned about you essentially just like covering all bases. So learn from my mistakes when I facilitate this with only designers. I love designers. I have a background in design, um, but we only talk about desirability risk mostly. <laughs> so we don't know where that is in relation to viability and feasibility risk. So um, I would just recommend trying to um, invite people to the session if at all possible, who can address these themes of risk. Because if you only go after, let's say these two themes of risk, right? Then you might have something people love and you they'll maybe pay enough for it, but then you can't deliver for whatever reason. A lot of Kickstarter crowdfunding campaigns end up in that regard. If you only go after these kinds of risk, right? Desirable, vi desirable and feasible, then you have something people love that you can build, but maybe you can't charge enough and therefore it fails because of that, because you can't charge enough money for it. And then maybe if you just go after feasibility and viability, well, unfortunately we still have a lot of things in the Valley that, like, that do this where we fund things for over hundred million dollars that just flop right away because we didn't spend time with the customer. And so I'm a big believer in kind of addressing all three of these risks, no matter what kind of industry I'm working in, you know, have representation that can go after this. So when you think about setting the stage, right? Ask the questions, figure out your on-ramp and make sure you have representation that can uh, help you really extract and map things uh, in a way that's productive, right? So how do you facilitate this? Um, wow, uh, th there could be a whole webinar in just this. I mean, basically uh, I facilitated hundreds, thousands, I don't know, <laughs> let's count over the years. Um, I wanted to give you like a sample agenda here. And so this isn't, you know, you can mess with these timings if you want, but there's kind of a flow and, and I'll zoom in a bit for you all too. Uh, there's kind of a flow to this that will help you, and again, learn from my mistakes in facilitating all these over the years. Basically, you, you wanna give some kind of introduction and overview um, to this. You don't wanna necessarily just jump right in. You wanna level set like, hey, this is what this is about. So similar, how I'm drawing the circles, you know, draw the circles, explain what the circles mean, you know, help kind of set the stage a little bit. It doesn't have to be like some giant masterclass on it, but basically give them a frame of reference of like, hey, this is what we're going to, you know, be getting into for today. And you just have to think about, you know, your risk. And then I kind of break it down, you know, I go after uh, the usually desirability ones first. All right. So um, I like starting there because there's a lot of your risk about the customer and the value prop. And then I do viability and then I do feasibility. That's a flow I like. It doesn't mean you have to follow that flow all the time, but I like that flow because it leads really well from one into the other. Um, 
if you want to spend more or less time on this, by all means, go ahead. But what I would uh, caution against is just having one time chunk where you just ask them to extract everything at once. Um, I've noticed people need a little more structure than that. So I usually break it down. I'm like, okay, guys, we're doing um, desirability for 15 minutes, go. And, and then they're just doing the orange, right? Then we go, okay, now, now we're back. Here's what viability means again. Okay, let's do viability, go. Here's what feasibility means. Okay, remember that blue one? All right, go. And so I break it, whether I'm in person or remote, I tend to break it up because I've learned over the years just ask them to do it all at once. Um, they just kind of flounder a bit or they might just you know only get through one theme through the workshop. Then we usually break because I try to break during, you know, give people time. It's kind of intense conversation, so give them a bit of break. And then we jump into mapping and I map almost the same way, right? Go and map the desirability ones, right? Go and map the viability ones, go map the feasibility ones. And so I try to give them, um, you know, just break it up because they, you know, teams will debate one sticky for the entire time box. And so we want to kind of get them moving and, and chunk it up so they can get through, um, you know, get through the mapping exercise. If you need to go longer, that's fine. I mean, I could go, I could easily, like the work will expand the time box. <laughs> so if you want to spend two hours doing desirability, I'm sure your team will go through each each orange sticky in two hours. <laughs> It'll take them two hours. So there's an element of like, we want our best guess, but we also want to make progress. And so over analyzing, just be mindful of your time boxes when you're, when you're uh, putting this together. And then we refine. So I like refining the, the top, um, you know, one to three out of your top right. And then plan for next steps uh, going and designing uh, the experiment. So, you know, obviously this leads into the library where you can select the experiment based on risk. And we'll get into that a bit in next steps. So when you think about this, um, you know, let's go back to uh, Trajuri for a moment. And so we're thinking about this food printer and um, some sample assumptions I might come up with if uh, I'm working with that team would be, uh, well, desirability, <laughs> you know, the orange. So desirability, again, it's a lot about evidence about the customer, about the value prop. And so this kind of do they question, right? Uh, of a desirability one might be, we believe restaurant patrons find our printed pastries tasty. It's kind of a tongue twister. So um, I like the we believe. So I try to write these as statements. And I picked this up, I think, from like Jeff and Josh, who wrote Lean UX, um, maybe also Barry O'Reilly <laughs> back in the day. But basically, I like the we believe um, because it's a belief that you're writing down. And it's a statement in the sense of when you think of, um, when you think of statements versus questions, what we do is we map them in regard to the statement and we say, do we have observable evidence to support the statement? So I like writing them as statements. If you want to do questions, fine. I have not had great luck with that, so I do. Uh, statements. So we believe restaurant patrons find our printed pastries tasty. Um, a green one, so a viability one might be around, we believe we can generate revenue by selling 3D food printers for 5,000 US dollars. So again, uh, we're trying to generate revenue, we're going to sell these, and here's the price point. And so um, try to stay away from things like uh, cheap, we can sell it, like it, it's going to be cheaper, faster, better, you know, I try to get teams to talk about uh, quantify when they can, but we also don't want them designing the experiment at this level. Like we want to stay at the assumption level of uh, a belief statement that potentially we could use multiple experiments to have supporting evidence or evidence that refutes it. So try not to get into like the experiment design at this level. It's hard, but try to keep bringing them back if they're stuck in the experiment design world yet, because we're trying to get to just like writing down what the risks are. Feasibility blue, we might write something like, we believe we can address legal and regulatory risks by getting FDA approval. Uh, again, this is something beyond just technical, right? It's also regulatory. And so uh, if you don't get FDA approval in the US, there's a good chance you know, to make something that is something consumed by food. And I'm not an FDA expert. There are different interpretations of the regulations. So I, I'd recommend reaching out to somebody who is like an FDA consultant or legal. But basically, um, if you can't get FDA approval, there's a good chance you're not going to be able to generate <laughs> revenue through something that can, like, is something people consume. And so that's something you could call out. And I also, optionally, I have this one, which is, um, I always get this question about adaptability or other risks that don't fall into those three buckets really cleanly. Um, I tend to use yellow for that color. And uh, you might have something like this, where we believe we can adapt to the existing supply chain shortages. There are different takes on this. Um, my thinking is still evolving, but 
but but if you are working with a team and there are assumptions that don't fit in the other categories, then just use another color and be like, okay, let's just get that out of your head. You think it's something related to the environment or adaptability, and that's fine. I don't have a lot of experiments at the moment in the book that go after adaptability. Personally, I think they, the adaptability risks influence desirability, viability, feasibility, and so they're like forces at play there. But um, if you, I don't want the teams also leaving stuff out just because it doesn't fit in a box. And so if you have an optional one that you want to include that's a different theme, then by all means, uh, go ahead and add it. And I would look for, uh, for each theme, uh, I would look for somewhere between like, you know, eight to 10 or so for each theme. We want them really thinking deeply about this, but I don't need like 30 for each one either, because that gets really overwhelming. And then trying to map all those can be somewhat challenging. So if you aim for somewhere between eight to 10, um, that's usually a good number for uh, each theme. And so what we do is we map them and that's kind of why you're here, right? Uh, we want to map them. And so we get them out of their heads first and then we have to figure out priorities. And so I like um, this two by two. Uh, again, I've changed the labels, I think at least three times over the years. Uh, I started with, uh, if you Google this, you're going to see known and unknown. You're going to see certain and uncertain. And now you're going to see have evidence and no evidence. I'm not as concerned about the exact labels you use, uh, but I am concerned about the team having a structured conversation about risk. Um, that is the most important part to me. So whatever labels you want to use, I, I kind of like just go for whatever works. I was literally doing this yesterday <laughs> or a couple of days ago, and the team was like, uh, this is like, a sure thing, or this is like hoping, <laughs> this is like whatever, however you want to frame it. Uh, it. It's just important to have the conversation about what will kill your business and being able to structure that. So I like these. Um, I like have evidence and no evidence because it really goes to the fact of, you know, is there any recent observable evidence to support the statement, right? So if you look at this one, we would pull over as a team. Now, don't just let one person dominate the conversation. And I'll get into that in a few. But have them talk as a team. So I might say, hey, this is our first sticky. We believe restaurant patrons find our printed pastries tasty. Um, how important is this to the success of the business? If like, is it like a 10? <laughs> or is it like, well, if they don't find it tasty, we have other avenues. Uh, or is it just like not important at all? And usually what will happen is they'll say, wow, if that's wrong, we're doomed. Because if it's not tasty, people won't eat it. <laughs> people won't buy it. And it's like, okay, so it's really important. Got it. All right. And usually early on, your orange ones are, are going to be more important uh, that I found. And then we could say, okay, well, do we have any evidence, observable evidence, quantitative, qualitative, that supports people finding this pastry, this, this the pasty, uh, pastry tasty? And uh, they're going to say, nope, because we haven't even created them yet. <laughs> so we're going to say, okay, that's far over here to the right. Um, just a note, interviews, surveys, I tend to put closer to the right. Uh, it's, I really, um, it, it hurts my heart when people say, I, I talked to a customer and validated that. And I was like, no, you didn't validate that. <laughs> that's great light evidence, directional evidence, but it's not validated. I mean, you have to do more. There's a difference between what they say and what they do. And so this whole evidence conversation, you know, your team's going to have questions. And so do your best to basically say, hey, if it's an interview or survey, it goes further to the right. <laughs> uh, if we have people paying for something, yeah, that's further to the left because they're literally paying for it. But just be mindful of that conversation. I always look for like, oh, I did this and validated it. And I'm like, mm, okay, let's take a pause. What did you do? Okay. Um, and, and so don't like be demeaning, but basically, you know, you have to take a step back and say, no, no, we had to recalibrate our confidence a bit here. The next one I would pull over and I would say, okay, and then this is what should really help you all. I will ask a question. I'll read it out. We believe we can generate revenue by selling 3D food printers for 5,000 US dollars. Is this more or less important than, pay, than the patrons finding it tasty? And people are going to say, well, that's a little bit less important because we can figure out different business models. But if they don't find it tasty, we're doomed. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like no one's ever going to buy it. I was like, oh, okay. So this is a little bit less important. Do we have any, like, is it more or less evidence compared to this as far as people willingness to pay? And here's where it gets interesting. Sometimes this ends up further over because we can say, oh, well, they already pay 5,000 US dollars for this and this and this and this, which are kind of like what we're going to create. Now, be careful you don't extrapolate too far. That's how all the Uber for X businesses failed, right? Because they thought, oh, Uber for rental cars, that's the same thing as Uber for house cleaning. And that's not the same thing, by the way. 
But a lot of the businesses I work with, you know, they look at what are other people spending money on that is like what we do, and you can use it as a reference point. I would not throw it all the way over here, right? Unless they've literally paid you for it. But you could say this is a little bit more evidence, not much more, but we have a little bit more evidence because people, the purchase behavior is like, you know, something that we have, all right? Then you bring over the next one. You can say, oh, FDA approval. Well, that's really important because if we don't get approval, <laughs> we're doomed. Um, and, and then people will say, well, I think that's kind of here because we're working with an FDA consultant and we think we can address this and he's going to handhold us through it, right? And same thing with this one. You know, you'd be like, okay, can we adapt? Well, that's kind of important, but if no one actually... Uh, you know, buys anything. It's not that <laughs> it's not as, you know, uh, game breaking as these, but it's a problem with scaling. And we do have some evidence that we have different distributors. And so, you know, this might end up over here. But my point is, when you facilitate it, you want to basically drag it over, state it out loud, have the participants participate, right? That's part of this exercise is talking. It's probably the most important part. And then be able to have them say reference point, more or less important, do we have more or less evidence? And shocker, they are going to be wrong. This is going to be a wrong map. It's just how wrong are you? And we're going to focus our experiments and we're going to find out how wrong we are. And we're going to come back to this. So please, this is not like a one-time event. We do basically go and, um, you know, we go and test and find out and come back and adapt our strategy. Um, what I do after that is, uh, I also lay this out in the book, is I pick something that's like in the top right, and I'll bring it down and then I'll start making it. Okay, let's refine these. So I've changed my approach over the years. I do mapping as uh, the first part and then I refine afterwards. If you refine these too soon, what happens is you might get a bunch that are refined and then they end up like, uh, like down here. And it's like, why did I map this and refine it? Or why did I refine it? Because this is something I'm not gonna focus on. And so it's a balance. But I've learned over the years to basically um, map and then refine, you know. And so then we take them through this process of, you know, uh, how would we test this, you know, in a way that's testable, precise, and discreet. So I go after these words like, uh, which restaurant patrons, <laughs> you know, like what restaurants and uh, what do you mean by tasty <laughs> and all of that. And so we would start basically um, refining these to be more testable, precise, and discreet, going from an assumption to a hypothesis, right? So what I might do instead is I might say, okay, that's a great start. Um, what restaurant patrons? Oh, and we would say something like, oh, San, like San Francisco, because uh, they all work in the Bay Area. I was in the Bay Area for like 10 years. Um, and then we say high-end luxury restaurant, right? Patrons. Oh, okay. Well, at least I know we're going to focus there, right? So high-end, like, okay. And then what do we how do we measure tasty? <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, well, maybe it's a preference. So they uh, prefer our 3D uh, printed. Um, we'll do short crust because it's short crust, basically short crust uh, pastries over um, traditional. Traditional ones, right? And so we can start. I'll, I'll make it a little bigger for you all so you can see it. But basically, you start like teasing it apart because you want it to be testable and precise and discreet in a way where you can um, go design an experiment for it. When I look at We Believe restaurant, restaurant patrons, it's like, okay, who, where, what do we mean by tasty? Like there's a lot of subjectiveness kind of baked in there. And so what I do with teams is once we map, we grab them out of the top right, we refine, and then we go from there to design experiments. And so for next steps, essentially what we do is, um, well, we, we go find experiments. <laughs> so that's part of the book, right? Is like 200, almost 200 pages of experiments. We match the theme of risk. Uh, so desirable, viable, feasible. I do not have adaptability in there. So we kind of just uh, make it work though. Um, we start cheap and fast. We try to choose our, what I call next best test. I didn't coin that, but I love that saying. I, I think I heard it from Jeff Patton first. Um, but basically we want to choose an experiment that gives us a little more evidence based on you know where we are today. So if closing that kind of say do gap. And then we want to defer building as long as possible. And so um, your teams don't want to jump to build. Like I wouldn't want this team to raise $100 million, build the printer, and then figure out how to market it. That is not the approach we're taking here or evangelizing. It's more of, okay, let's find out directional leading evidence. You know, is this something that people will pay for and that we can do? And in that, I typically start with the discovery section of experiments. And we don't have enough time today to cover all 44 experiments. 
but you know, the book is a great resource for that. And I coded them specifically in these themes. So you could flip to the page and find out the experiment to branch off of, you know, from after you've mapped and refined your assumptions into hypotheses. And basically revisit your map, you know, uh, things are going to be wrong. I think that's really hard for teams to understand. You get paid incentivized for being right. We love being right. Uh, you're going to be wrong somewhat initially <laughs> and use what you've learned when you run your experiments to come back and inform the map. And so that's really important. And then, um, uh, I asked my quotes, like I asked my team, you know, like what assumptions do we need to move? So they should go across, right. Or up and down. They don't stay static in the same point in the map over time. Uh, which ones no longer apply? Uh, what new assumptions do we have? And then some of my teams, what I love what they do is they take like little snapshots of their experiments, uh, of their um, assumptions maps. And they look over time and say, we started here and now we're here. And they're able to communicate risk and how it's changed over time. So much like you would take snapshots of canvases, I see my teams taking snapshots of their assumptions maps to show what has moved, what have they de-risked over time. They say, oh, this was really important before, but we learned more about it. And this other thing's now really important because your risk kind of moves around over time. Okay. So uh, throw your questions in chat. I know we're almost at time here, but basically uh, what I wanted to focus on here was just like getting you, um, getting, getting you like more well equipped to run these, right? So setting the stage, facilitating the session, and then what to do afterwards. And, and this is kind of an overview, but I just wanted to share my latest thinking with you all uh, with regards to um, assumptions mapping. I, I feel like the facilitation itself, you know, just simple things like saying, is this more or less important, more or less evidence, um, that, that makes it so much easier versus people just really hand wringing and just really stressed out over where to put the sticky. Uh, we have a question here as what is involved in mapping as opposed to extracting? Um, yeah, so um, the way I tried to, to lay this out was the extracting is, is sort of here, right? So the extracting is we look at these themes, right? And we try to ans ask questions to extract. And I have also, um, I have some cheat sheets and stuff I use, and some of that's in the book as well. But I start asking questions about like the unmet needs and the jobs and such for desirability. I'll start asking questions about willingness to pay, profit. Uh, keeping costs low around viability. I'll ask questions around, can we do this? What would get in the way? What would stop us from doing this in feasibility? And so um, some of these are referenced here a bit, but they're also in a lot of the templates I have. They're in the mural template. They're in some of the templates off of the Precoil site too. But basically um, I use kind of like a structured list of questions to extract. And so I want cross uh, functional representation to extract and try to like get out of their heads because everyone's usually worried about this stuff, but it's in their heads and they're not necessarily communicating it properly or have space to do so. And so that's part of the extracting. So that's like one step, right? And then the mapping is when we pull it over and we use a two by two and we say, okay, how important is this to the success of the business? And then do we have any evidence um, to support this? And, and so that is more of, you know, um, just the, the sorting and mapping the kind of quadrants. And so where we basically want to experiment is, um, is up here in the top, right? So when we go to experimentation and I'm biased because it's pretty much what I help companies do, right? We want to experiment here. Uh, we don't necessarily want to experiment down here as much because, um, it's stuff that's not necessarily as important. And I want you to tie your experiments back to risk, right? So I pretty much ignore anything below the line. You, you probably don't want to tell them that before they map though. <laughs> it's more of a after the fact thing. And then, um, you know, what we call like the um, riskiest assumptions or um, leap of faith, like uh, assumptions, right? Um, this is the top right. And so basically you want to pull from there and refine and then get to a point where you can design experiments to meet that. So I think this is something we're still uh, trying to encourage teams to do. The point is not necessarily um, running experiments. The point is de-risking what you're working on. And so be careful with this because if you only share out how many experiments you're running, then what can happen is you can um, give the illusion of progress by running experiments, but you're not necessarily paying down the risk of the initiative. And so that's something that we have to be uh, really careful about. Um, <laughs> I explained to five minutes after you asked. Yeah, I, I tend to like, uh, 
I kind of know what questions people are going to ask sometimes, so I just bake it, <laughs> bake it in here. Uh, is there any way to do this if the CEO believes he knows it all and has hunches and, and that will make great future features? Yeah, that comes back to the mindset and also um, basically the, uh, you know, do you have strong opinions aspect that I referenced up here, right? So when you're setting the stage, it's good to kind of uh, tease out some of this. And with regards to if you have a really opinionated leader, you know, being able to, to just get them to talk what they're worried about. Um, that's one of my kind of tricks that I'll share with you all today is get them speaking about what they're worried about. And then that those worries tend to match these themes in some way. And you don't tell them that, right? You're just like, hey, what are you worried about about this? And there's probably something they're worried about. And once you start getting them talking about what they're worried about, then you can back your way into these themes. And from there, you can back your way into the mapping. But yeah, there's an element of um, helping them, you know, kind of frame things, get it out of their head. And, you know, some people, they just, they're not going to come along for the journey, right? They're going to like build it and they will come. And if they come, they look like geniuses. And I think uh, I worked with enough companies and been a part of enough companies over the years that sometimes they don't come. <laughs> the people, after we build it, they, they don't show up. And so I think um, being able to kind of frame things, what are you worried about? Um, how do we frame this? I, I think it helps get them out of the heads, structure it, and then say, oh, well, how do we go check about that thing you're worried about sooner versus later? And you don't use the word experiment as much. It's like, hey, how do we go check? And so use voice of the customer, try to get them to talk what they were, like what they're worried about, and then, you know, use experiments to go um, address that. All right. So I see some other questions. I know we're out of time. We actually went over. I'm always bad at timekeeping. It's a California thing, I guess. Um, something I want to just promote here is uh, we do have an upcoming uh, cohort that we're doing. And so um, I'm having a blast doing these. These are basically like you get time with me over the course of 10 days and I help you work on your real ideas. And so it's a small group of people. It's not as big as the master classes or the giant workshops I do. It's kind of a more intimate setting. And we walk through each step of this. We'll take your idea. We'll do assumptions mapping on it. We'll basically ex extract the refine. We'll design experiments for your idea and test them out and just walk you through every step of the process along the way. And so just let you know, tickets are on sale for that. Uh, it's kicking off this October. So um, if you want in on it, just uh, either send me a note or you can visit that link and I can give uh, any more you know, questions you have about the program. Happy to discuss it as well. So I hope you all enjoyed this. Again, um, I didn't want to kill you with slides today. So use Mural and just kind of live sketched it all out. But I wanted to give you some behind the scenes of assumptions mapping, you know, uh, how you set the stage, how do you facilitate it, and, and some next steps, give you some tips and tricks, because I know you're all using this and we could all get better. I learn every single time I do it. I learn more and more and more about what to do and what not to do. So I'll take your questions out of the Q&A and I'll uh, try to address those after today. And I just appreciate you all for coming. So thanks and good luck with mapping assumptions with your teams, it's sorely needed still building so many things that people don't need. <laughs> so you're fighting the good fight. <laughs> so cheering you all on. Thanks, everybody.